Let's have prayer. Here's what we do. We say the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't be learned nor lived in carnality. Evidence of carnality, the idea of carnality is 1 Corinthians, the third chapter and the first three verses. But the evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. So what should I do to get out of carnality and back into spirituality? Because these are the opponents within us. These two are in opposition to one another, the flesh versus the spirit. Galatians 5, 16, and 17. You confess your sin. If you're in carnal, the evidence is personal sin. You confess your sin, according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So <clears throat> that confession of sin God has extended the work of the blood of Christ from the cross to the Christian life in an atoning way in regard to confession of sin it it cleanses not for salvation this time but for fellowship ministry of the Holy Spirit which is really important for Bible study isn't it I mean this is a key so let's go ahead and take that moment of personal prayer. Every believer that believes that Jesus died for his sin was buried and raised from the dead. The gospel is saved and has, because he lives in the new covenant, he is a priest, 1 Peter 2. And as a priest, you confess your sins as often as you're aware of it, no matter where you are, no matter what time of the day. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth tonight of James, the fourth chapter, verses 5 and 6, <laughs> that we might <clears throat> understand it within the context and understand it within hermeneutical principles that are important as we uh, discuss scriptures and how to apply it. The importance of all scripture <clears throat> is that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God and then it becomes uh, applicable to the life because we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we look at these things very seriously, Father, because of the application side to our life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, once again, James opens our lesson text with a question. Now, this is kind of important. If you, if you pay attention to James, he loves this debater technique by questioning. Um, I don't know if you grew up in a family like that, but I did. We were farm people, and everything dealt with questions. Well, what about, yeah, 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 well, <laughs> what do you think would happen if, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was our life. <laughs> That's how they taught us. Where I grew up, it was, you lived by questions. And uh, the Greeks were those kind of people, not necessarily the, the Hebrew that much. And so it's really interesting that James used this cultural technique as much as he does. It shows a little bit about his education and his interest in uh, discussing things. Uh, Paul is very good with it. Luke was very good at it. Most educated people of that of the day were very good in it. Either that or they were just very good common sense people. When Jesus went to the masses and taught, he taught by parables that was filled with his idea. You remember that? No. Next time you read a parable, pay attention to it because he was the way he did it. <clears throat> so James opens with a question uh, at verse uh, 5. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? That's not the question. It goes on. He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. We'll talk more about that next week. I'm talking about hermeneutical principles tonight. Um, but he asked a question. But the question doesn't come till the end of a lot of times, James, like in the first chapter, he would ask a question. The second question would give an answer. Look, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source? So he asked the source, what is the source? 
is not the source your pleasures that war against your members. And he talked, to, and he's into the subject of hedonistic reversionism. Remember the word pleasure? Remember, we talked about that. See, that's a typical way to do that. He didn't do that here, yet he's asked that. In fact, in the first five verses, uh, he has asked four questions. He's asked four questions. We've looked at the first three, and now we're looking at fourth. Uh, so questioning, the use of questionings, became a cause of necessary, in this case, is just because of verse 5 and 6. People don't pay attention to how many times questions have been asked of what the subject is. But they jump into the middle of a passage, and they go, I don't know what this means. And uh, so you have to bring proper uh, tools of interpretation. We call it hermeneutics. But a lot of unnecessary confusion is in this passage because they don't, they don't use uh, proper uh, tools. Uh, and, and so I want to explain some of that to you tonight. Uh, you know, people say, we, I hear people just say to them, well, you're making a, a lot, you're making a lot out of nothing. <laughs> But when you hear the Bible, it's nothing. It's a, do you do this with no purpose? Mm-mm. <clears throat> what, what the metaphor ought to be is making a mountain out of a molehill. Because the scripture, there is no such thing. Do you, do you study, is the, does the scripture have no purpose? Is, it, is, is, it, is the scripture in vain? Does it have no direct purpose to your life? Listen. All scripture has direct purpose to your life in some way or another. One way to correct textual confusion is to study the theological history of the book, the Greek text, and apply hermeneutic principles to it. You say, well, I don't know that I could do that. You can to, after tonight. You say, well, I don't know the Greek language. I know, but you need to sit with somebody who does. And if you did want to learn the Greek language, we're teaching it now on Saturdays every second and fourth. So if you go to this church without excuse. So I want to talk about six things. The next six points, we'll do briefly these things. We'll talk about a little history of the book, which is important. We're going to talk a little bit about the Greek text, which is important. And we're going to apply hermeneutics, hermeneutical principles, principles of interpreting the scriptures properly. Is just the answer for that big word. Point number one. We're going to begin by making three points on the history of the book of James. See, people jump in the middle of a book. Look, do, do me a favor. Look at the very front of your of the book of James. Look at the very front. I mean before before it starts teaching you. Before you have James 1 1. I want everybody to do that. Is there a section, before you get to, uh, to in your Bible, is there a section in James called introduction or the thought of introduction? And in that introduction, do you have an introduction? If you don't, you need to pray to the Lord to give you a study Bible. I would, rec I would recommend uh, the New American Standard, if you, if you attend here, I would recommend a uh, new American Standard Bible, uh, and Riley. I would recommend Riley for you. Now, there are others, and they're good. I'm just telling you a good, a good one that, would, that would be a, one book would be a great library for you. If you have that, you should always read that. If you go into a book and you don't know why that book was written, to whom it was written, and what is the purpose of the book, in general, when you reach in there and grab a verse and pull it out, you could be in trouble with it. And if there is discussion in your head, what does it mean? The first thing, the first thing you should do is go back to the introduction and read the introduction. Who wrote it? What was the date? Who did, was it written to? And why was it written in general? And what kind of outline would it be? Because when, you, when they do that, they're going to show you they're going to give you an outline to the purpose of the book. 
and you will look down there and find the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 10, and a subject, which would be very important to you. Does your do th does yours do that? Does it give you that? Does it give you an outline of the book? Okay. If it does, that's really good because you want it. Now, when you look at the outline of your book, look at chapter 4. Does it just show you the whole thing or does it break it down into segments or context? Context? Does it go one through four, one through ten, one th four, one through ten, and then, and then uh, uh, six through? Uh, the, how does it break it down? Does it break it down in two sections or three sections? Four. Chapter four. That see, that's good. See, and that's what you. That's a good study Bible. What they just did is they broke the chapter down into four contexts. So when you pull a text out of any of those contexts, you're required. You're required to read it all. You do not know what the text says until you know what the context says. It would like somebody writing you a letter and just pull one verse out of it. We call that taking it out of what? <laughs> you got the picture? It's called taking it out of context. And listen, now we call that fake news. Right? When people go off, take it out of context and go off and write a whole piece on it and destroys a person's life and then they found out later it's not true and the person's been, right? I mean, how terrible is that? So don't do it to the Bible. So these are, these are tools for you. These are, you have a great Bible. The English Bible is a great Bible. But you need to get one you can buy one Bible that has all of these tools in it for you. Why wouldn't you make that? Listen, if your tires are worn down and the snowstorm comes, doesn't it make sense to go buy new tires to be equipped properly? Why would you buy new tires? All my tires are okay. But they're all, they got no tread on them. Save up your $50, go on Amazon. You can probably buy it for less than that and invest or get your children asked like I do. What I want that expensive, I say to my children, listen, I want such and such for Christmas. You want to do me something? Buy this for me. For, so they all get together and now, you know, I'd rather have one thing I really like than 20 things I don't. I don't know about you, but that's just me. So, this is how you start. When you jump into a book and quote a passage, you better, you better well know because you speak for God, don't you? You speak for God. So you better well know what you're talking about. And there's no reason not to. Your Bible could be a really good Bible, but it doesn't have all the tools in it you need, see? Have a Bible that has all the tools in it. Learn to use your tools. Every good craftsman knows how to use his tool. Would you believe that? It's what makes him a craftsman rather than just a helper. <laughs> it's the guy that knows how to use his tools. Now, let me take point number one. We're going to begin by looking at three points on the history of the book of James. I'm just going to cover this a little bit. I got three points under point one. I got A, B, C. We know that the book of James was written very early and circulated among Jewish believers dispersed abroad. That's James 1.1. We know that. Where were they dispersed abroad and why? Persecution. These are Christian Jews persecuted and had to run for their life and they ran into all neighboring nations right? Just like everybody does. And they had to go through a process of, of uh, border security and everything, just like we talk about today. You just couldn't go in there. Uh, you know, these, this is you're a citizen of another country that you're not a citizen of, and so you have to go through a process, and the process was there uh, for um, fleeing persecution, just like we have today. And so, they were dispersed abroad. 
uh, because of persecution. The, the, another thing we know about the writing of the book, it was written before the Jerusalem Conference of 50 A.D. We know that. James was a major pastor. J James, the half-brother of Christ, we call him the half-brother because they had different fathers. Agreed? Do you agree? Okay. Okay. Because sometimes that, that throws us because that's not a cultural thing. That's a theology thing. Right? We know this because he's a head pastor, and we know a great deal about James from other writings, the book of Acts and things of that. We, we know a great deal about this pastor of Jerusalem called James, a half-brother of Jesus. We know that this, because just the, what's left out of the book that should have been put in it, we know this was before the conference. The second thing that's important to the book of James, so this is a very early book, among the earliest books. Some believe it's the very earliest book ever written. Well, could be. Thir from 30 to 30, that's the, the, life time, the time period of life of Christ is, is crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, Pentecost. 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. Is, an, is the first period of the church age. It was a period, uh, 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 30, I said 30 through 70 A.D., my second point was 30 to 100. I went a larger, I'm going to come back to it. 30 to 100 AD was a period of great uh, transition. Fr from 30 to 100 was a period of great transition. Now, there's two periods in there that are important. You got, there are actually three. The 30 AD at Pentecost where the church began. Then you got 70 AD when the fifth cycle came to Israel. They went under the fifth cycle of divine discipline by Rome. Rome really put it on them. And then you have 100 AD. Listen to me, when the completed canon of the scripture was done, the entire, the book you hold was completed by then. That's Matt, from Matthew to Revelation. They, it was out in circulation, wasn't in print other than circulation. Wasn't, you couldn't go down and buy a whole Bible like that. You could buy an Old Testament, then you had to, you had to find these others that were being circulated until they finally became printed. So from a 30 to 100 A.D. was a period of great transition. Now, this transition is important. Now, listen to me. People in the church do not understand this transition, and it's a gap in history in your life, and you don't understand this. There are 10 great periods. There are 10 great transitions in this period from 30 to 100 A.D. Now, listen, that's only 70 years, and boy, did God have a whirlwind go through. This is a whirlwind of stuff. For, I'm just going to mention four because I don't have time tonight to do with all 10 of them, but one night I'll come back and do them. There's a change in dispensations. That's historical periods, hi historical periods of biblical time. A transition. From 30 AD to 100, we're going through a change from the Jewish age to the church age. You and I live in the church age. Jesus lived in the church age, in the Jewish age. We live in the church age. And the the debarking mind of that, the 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 draw the line in the sand business is 30 AD at Pentecost. The other thing that's a major event is a change of covenants from the old covenant, which we call the Old Testament, to the new covenant which we call the New Testament. They, these are covenants. Everybody prior to 30 AD lived under the old covenant. Everybody after 30 AD lived under a new covenant thinking. Old covenant thinking, new covenant thinking. Let me show you how important this is. And we know Jesus was the key. The Eucharist. When Jesus did it in Luke 22, the Eucharist, you know, the Lord's Supper, communion, you know, the bread and the cup. When Jesus did it in, in Luke, the 22nd chapter, it was Old Covenant. And he switched it at that time into New Covenant thinking. This, this bread is my body that's going to bear your sin. This cup is my blood in regard to your sin, the body and the blood of Christ in regard to sin, right? Well, tell me you do that when you take part in the Eucharist. This is a, this is, 
the cup of the blood of Christ of the new covenant. So that was a big deal. So that was an enormous big deal. I mean, this was an enormous celebration. Passover. Passover. Passover is Exodus 12 when they put the blood on the doorpost of the houses and the death angel passed over and Israel went, went out of there under the grace ministry of God. It's a big deal. Passover is a big deal. And this is what the cup was. It was the cup of the Passover. And that deal, that whole death angel business has now been transferred to the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> big deal. That's a big deal. Divine agency change. The divine agency. In the old covenant, the divine agency, the divine agency are those that God has assigned to be custodians of evangelism and the word of God. In the old covenant, the period that we're talking about, that's important, this transitional period, you, who was in charge was the priest nation of Israel. They were called the priest nation of Israel, Exodus 19. They were called the priest nation of Israel. <clears throat> After Pentecost, we have now every believer is a priest. You have a, a Levitical system before Pentecost. You have a church age system afterwards. The entire body of Christ is called a priesthood. The, listen, the moment you got saved, you became a priest of the Lord Jesus Christ, a priest. You can read that in 2 Peter 2. And the fourth thing I would mention here that's important, that it went from a partial. At Pentecost, they had a completed Bible. They had a, a partial Bible. Old Testament was completed. And they were carrying it around like you are. It was called the Septuagint. That was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, as well as the, the Hebrew part. But the Hebrew part was pretty much contained in in separate things that the Jewish people had control of. And the Septuagint put the Bible in everybody's hands. You could read the Bible without having a rabbi. The rabbi had access to the, the canons. Just like the English Bible put it in the hands of everybody, took it out of the hands of just the priests of the Catholic Church. He put it in the, the Pro Protestant brought the Bible to the average guy on the street. Just think about this. Think how many Bibles the church in America sends to the rest of the world. Millions. We send millions. Bibles to the rest of the world. Those that let us in. And those who won't let us in, other people take them and they smuggle them in. They will give their life to own a Bible. And there are many nations where one community has one Bible and it's kept in secret. And they, they meet in secret and study it because it is their lifeline to God. So... This is an enormous period of time. James is writing in the mid-40s, somewhere in the mid-40s. Pentecost has started in 30, and we're in the mid-40s, and he's writing this book out in the midst of this enormous transition, and he's the pastor of this enormous transition period. It's important to know that. And he's in the thick of it, and he's trying to make adjustment in his life because his whole life, he's been in old covenant. Now he's asked to transition, and he's struggling. We see it all through the, his, 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 every time he appears, he's in a struggle about all this transition. I'm not talking about just moving the church from Roebuck to Moody transition. <laughs> I'm talking about. I'm talking about transitions that are mind-blowing. And God is really after it. Now, in, set, in 30, so, and so James is writing during this period, and he's in transition himself. He's struggling trying to keep up with all this. It's, it's happening at light speed. 
this transition is happening in light speed. I mean, light speed, 40 years is light speed to nations. From 30 to 70 AD was a period of great theological apostasy within the Jewish religion. Now, it started way earlier than that, but it was certainly, the apostasy was blatant. How do you know it? The Jewish nation hung their Messiah, knowing he was the Christ, hung him on a cross and crucified him. as a number one criminal of their, of their nation. That's pitiful. Of all the people that should have not killed Christ, it was the Jews. Should have never done that. Should have never done it. How could, how could they get to a place from a, being a priest nation of custodian of the word of God advantage to a place they were willing to kill for that it's called apostasy, absolute apostasy, the blackout of a soul, a hardened, bitter soul. John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, both who were, by populist opinion, great prophets sent to their nation, Everybody agreed about that. So just taking that in mind, John, John talked about him. I wrote on your paper, well worth your read later. John, the third chapter, he talks to him. He brings him a message about Messiah. Then the Messiah Christ comes along in the 12th chapter, verses 22 through 45. And then later in the famous passage of Matthew 23, 1 through uh, 1 through 39, John and Jesus both call this religious group of apostate people brood of vipers. A brood of vipers. That's poisonous snakes. A brood, a brood, a, a large colony set loose on the people. Old Testament gives you a lot of reference to that idea in case you're interested in what they were saying to him. Then Jesus comes back in Matthew 23, and he identifies this group as hypocrites, spiritual, theological hypocrites, and blind guides. You see, both of them were identifying the apostasy of the condition of the Jewish religion at the time of Pentecost and beyond. Point number two. See, that's the background. See, you ought to know a little bit of that to know what James is contending with as he's writing. The canonicity of the book of James was questioned by Christian scholars for the lack of New Covenant basic doctrinal teaching in it. It seemed that they finally settled on James being the half-brother of Jesus and pastor and spokesman, spokesman of the first mega church. The first mega church in Christianity was the church at Jerusalem. People were being saved by three and 5,000 numbers. The church was humongous. And James was their pastor and spokesperson. But their bigger concern about the book of James was that it presented problems. James was a master of presenting problems, but without sufficient new, new covenant doctrinal solutions. When you read the book of, jo jo of James, he, he doesn't give you really solid answers of new covenant doctrine. It's, it's very vague as far as new covenant doctrines. This is important when you study and teach from it because you have to present, you have to add, you have to present New Covenant doctrinal solutions for application to the Christian way of life, which you don't have to do with Paul because he did it. When you read Paul's writings, even some of his early writings, boy, he was on top of these New Covenant doctrines of theology. And, um, 
you know, then uh, uh, theologians refer to Paul as Pauline theology. It, it is so prevalent of importance. For example, in the book of James, out of, out of uh, there are 108 verses in the book. There are 22 allu allusions uh, to the book uh, to the book of the Old Testament, to books of the Old Testament, and 15 allusions to Jesus' Jewish teaching, like the Sermon on the Mount. But for the great for the great new new covenant theology teachings, this book lacks a lot. It, but it's early, and it's important to understand why. Okay? A lot of that hasn't been developed, and James is in the process of doing it. So when you go in the book and you teach from it, you've got to be aware of that, and you've got to be able to supplement uh, that issue. The third thing. One of the great things about hermeneutics or, the, or interpretation of scriptures, proper interpretation of scripture, is keeping text in context. I can't tell you how important it is. So much false teaching and, and just so much of it comes from f faulty hermeneutics. And a lot of it could be corrected if pastors or preachers or whoever's teaching the Bible would keep text in context. Otherwise, it's their opinion. And listen, their opinion better be pretty solid what God says. You want God's opinion, not man's. I encourage you to challenge everything I tell you. It's got to hold up under the examination of the rest of the Bible. Keeping text in context is, is an important hermeneutic principle. It is very important for correct application. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, here's what it says. Walk by faith, not by sight. Listen to Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you've got to be sure that what you're studying can be put into faith because faith has to be put into your life in your walk, in your daily walk. You understand? So if you're going to walk this out for God, that's usually should be your desire. You got to be sure that what you're being fed is going to be able to be applicable to your daily living and being on top of your game for God. Because you got to walk by faith and not by sight. And one of the ways you keep your people there is by always be, sh always be sure that they know that the context of the text whether you either read the whole thing or you explain it and then push your point. People just reach in, they grab the scripture, and then they run off with it, God knows where, and they've left the context. You can't run off and tell the context and explain to your people. For example, the context to our verses 5 and 6 is James 4, 1 through 10. James, when you study James 1, 4, 1 through 10, you discover that it can be divided in two parts. James 4, 1 through 5, and James 6 through 10. Watch this. Watch this. Now I'm going to explain it to you. Let me show you this to you. <clears throat> The four questions, James asks four questions that go from verse 1 through verse 4. Watch this. What is the source of quarreling and conflicts among you? Question 1. Answer in question 2. Is not the source of your pleasure hedonistic reversionism, is what he's talking about, the Greek word hedon. Is not the source of your pleasures 
that wage war in your marriage is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members. Then he explains, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motive so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now he further makes further comment. You adulteresses, is that spiritual? Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Question. There's your third question. Therefore, conclusion, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Fourth question. Or, or, what has he just said? Therefore, listen to me, or goes with this. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose or in vain? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Fourth question. There are four questions on this subject that go all the way to verse 5. And the word or is very important as a trailer hitch. It connects you to verse 4. With the conclusion, therefore. Therefore is a conclusion. Would you agree with that? Yeah, of course it is. Therefore. You see? Now we come to verse 6. He uses but, which is in contrast, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, second conclusion, therefore is that now we're, we're working on solution. Therefore, it says, scripture ver, mentioned in verse 5, not explained. Therefore, the scripture says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We're still in the therefore. That's the first step. We're still in the therefore. Second step, submit therefore. Therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Because if you get involved in hedonism, it's a bad thing. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. You know what he just did? You missed it, but that's okay. Everything in verses 1 through 4 he call, is a description of what he calls out of Proverbs 3, 3, 34, the proud. God does not give grace to the proud. He gives it to the whom? Humble. And you know what? That, that's humbled in, in the presence of God's grace. Pride is opposed or opposed or in, in to grace. What we have in verses 6 through 10 is a description of what God desires in a humble, grace-oriented person. Do you see that? All I did was look at the text, but I looked at it really hard. I looked at it really hard. You know how you study the Bible? You read it and pray to God. Holy Spirit, teach me the truth. When he shows you, when you read through and you see, you look for markers and you see, you see he's, he's using questions. You know, Jane, this is a method, a scriptural method of trying to pull you in to get you to hear. You ask questions. Try to get to the bottom of things. You go to a psychologist you know what he does? He asks you a thousand questions as he digs deeper into your life through questions. How do we really know? I'm here. I'm here to talk to you. I don't know. Where do you want to start? It's up to him to get it rolling. He starts moving it and he starts digging. Does it through questions. It's the shovel he uses. 
Well, so, you know, you just look at that, and, you, and then all of a sudden you see this stuff. Look at it. You should see these things. It's The Holy Spirit is the one that teaches that. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I got this from him. I mean, I'm just a messenger, but, but I want to know exactly what the Bible tells me. This is somebody says, well, look, listen, I'm running late. Do you know where such and such it is? Yeah, you just go down, uh, go down the same, let's see, wait a minute. You go down, well, wait a minute. You go down, uh, geez, nah. well, let's, wait a minute. You go to the third light, now wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got to say, second light, third light. Yeah, you go down, oh, wait a minute. how long are you going to stay there when you're laid down an appointment? This guy's not sure where you're going. Man, I want to know. You see, these are the people who think that the scriptures has really no, really no purpose. You just do this, do that. It's not about the scriptures. It's always about the scriptures. What does God say? It's always about the scripture. Look, look, you missed it. It's okay, but look, do you think the scripture speaks in vain that King James says? They say here, no purpose. Without any intent to your life? No, of course not. Of course not. Then why do you do that, he's saying? So, look, all I'm talking about is the importance of context. If you're going to take a text, you've got to give context. You've got to be able to look at that. Then you look at it and you, you study it, and the Holy Spirit will show you how he wrote it. The Holy Spirit wrote it. He can certainly read it. He wrote it. He can read it. I was watching a movie the other night with my wife, and they had a, a couple people, and they written books. And then they were on a tour, and they each read from their book. And when they, when they, the ones that took ownership of the reading of the book, because the book came from their soul out, the ones that took ownership from it, people went, oh, I like that. The ones who didn't take ownership and show what, how they were engaged in what they wrote. You understand? You know, you can walk around to people and all day long and you say, well, you ought to believe in Jesus. Then you live like the devil. How much do you think they're going to believe that stuff? Right? You know, the person that says he loves you all the time beats you up every day? I love you. As, is, as we would say in the farm, that's a, that's a sh poor way of showing it. That's a poor way of showing it. So when we look at the context, we divide it in two. We see the problem. We see the solution. Verses 1 through 5, 6 through 10. We always pay attention to James' use of questions to present problems that need addressing. Like I mentioned, there are four of them in the first five verses. And all four questions deal with the problem, not the solution. That should be obvious to you. Here's my fourth point. Another hermeneutical tool is identifying all the Greek sentences in the context. Now, I know in your Bible you can't do that because you don't have a Greek text. You could get one. You could, you could actually get a Bible that has, a Greek, has the Greek and the English together in it. But if, one of the, the, if not always is the English correct in where they're putting punctuations. But the Greek text is very important. And so for me, a teacher of the Word of God, it's important for me to, to look at my Greek Bible and identify periods. <laughs> That makes the end of a sentence. Commas don't, semicolons don't, colons don't, but periods do. So that's important to me. When I looked at my Greek text of James 4, 1 through 10, there are seven sentences in the Greek. In the fourth chapter, 1, 2, you will find a period if you look really close. There's a period. Verse 3 is a period. Verse 4 is a period. 5, 6 is one sentence. My text that I'm giving you tonight, 5, 6 is one sentence. 7 and 8, one sentence. Verse 9, a sentence. Verse 10, a sentence. Why is that important? Well, it's important to me because a sentence is completed thought. If a person is talking to you and stops in the middle of a conversation, you don't have a completed thought. 
Agreed? And often, often that's exactly how conversations start and stop, and everybody leaves confused. <laughs> right? What did he mean by that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. So you always pay attention to the Greek language. You always pay attention. This is important to our lesson text because James 5, 4, 5 and 6 is one Greek sentence, one completed thought. Five and six is one completed thought. Now I didn't I didn't look, but I read a um, we have we have a colon. In the Greek language, a colon and a semicolon identified the same way, so you have to pay attention to it. So you can see there's a there's a there's a, a colon in my Greek one, and then there's a question. And then we go along in verse six, and then at the end of verse six we have a period that brings us into that idea one completed thought you can't jump in a, in a text you got to take a look at it and see if you stopped in the middle of a thought now a lot of times the english can really care a good study bible can carry a long way it's it's a pretty good it's a pretty good gauge to go by i mean you, you should go by that in your bible for example just look at verse five doesn't have a period does it but verse six does did you know in the middle, up there in the middle, right after to no purpose or in vain, it, it's, a sem, it's, it's a probably a colon. Could be a semicolon or a colon. And then he goes on and asks a question. See? And then you have verse, you have verse 6 uh, where you get the period. All right? So this is kind of important when we're looking at verses 5 and 6. This is important because the scripture mentioned in verse 5 is quoted in verse 6. It says, James 4, 5 is part of the, still part of the problem of hedonistic reversionism, and James 4, 6 is part of introducing the solution. Do you see that? Well, gosh, it's obvious, but he, but, but he gives greater grace. See? And we still know we're still working with the problem in five because it's connected to the four questions. It's, now, point five. Another interesting Greek grammar that James uses used here is that is called a dysfunction in the Greek language. I'm going to show you what it looks like. And you always, you always pay attention to that. It starts with that. That's what it is. That's the word or in the Greek language, in the English, we call that or we call it dysfunction is a correlative. When, it, when you have a dysfunction, a, 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 a disjunction, you're looking for a disjunction correlates it with something else. I call it a trailer hitch. That's exactly what or is. If you have a Greek Bible, you will go home, you will look at your Greek Bible, and you'll, you'll find that thing. And it's called a disjunction. This disjunction connects 4, 5 to 1 through 4, and especially 4, because 4 is a separate verse, and it begins with therefore, making a conclusion. Are you with me? I know. I know there's a whole lot of stuff, and you go, like, where's it going to get to me? I'm trying to teach you how to study the Bible. I'm trying to teach you. James 4 gives the first doctrinal conclusion of the status of heathenistic reversionism. These are people whose life, they give their life to pleasure rather than God. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I die. So I'm going to get it all now. You understand that? You understand that philosophy? All right. So what we're talking about, when we talk about hedonism, that's what we're talking about. And it could be good pursuit or bad pursuit. It doesn't matter. It's that pleasure trumps, trumps God.
listen to listen to my point six. Comparisons between James four. Watch this now. Let me tell you, all I'm doing is reading the Bible, I, but I'm breaking it down for of interest to show you how to read the Bible. In verse four, look at verse four. In when he when he. Uh, uh, Verse four, do this is a this is a separate sentence in the Greek. You adulterers, do you not know? The Paul uses that all the time. Do you not know? That was a common Greek debater technique. All the guys used it. Do you not know? And they're, what they're saying is, if you didn't, you should. And if you do, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> you with me? I mean, we say that, we teach that way to our kids. They drive us nuts. That's, now I'm into grandkids. They drive you nuts. Did you spend your whole life? Do you not know? Do you, if you know, why did you? <laughs> you that's your whole life in, in teaching your children. Do you not know? Watch that. And then, and then, and then he issues a warning with it. Do you not know? R look it up there. Do you not know? And then he, do you not know? And he tells you friendship with the world that friendship with the world is hostility with God. Then he, draw, then he draws a conclusion. Therefore, do you see that? Well, please tell me, you know, when you get to a therefore, why you're there. Okay. Okay. Therefore, now look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. He does it again. Look at verse 5. Or connecting. See, the idea is going on. He's connected. Even though four is a sentence by its own, five, six is a sentence by his own, and he's connected. He's trailer hits it. We've piggybacked it. Piggy, piggybacked it. Right? Or, watch this. Do you think, there it is, do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? Now we've got a rhetorical. The answer should be what? Listen, that scripture never speaks in vain. The scripture never speaks without purpose. God never speaks to hear himself talk. Are you talking to hear yourself talk? <laughs> That's for sure, not God. Then he talks about it again. Then he gives it, he talks about it again here, and then he says, but he gives greater grace, therefore, now he jumps into a second conclusion, and now he's on a chain of recovery. Are you with me? See, that's un in the Greek, that word therefore. This, this, this is the way you study the Bible. This is the way you study it. You, you, you read it. You look at it. You say, God, what are, you, what are you showing me? Teach me. The Holy Spirit lives in you to teach you the word of God. John 14, 15, and 16 talks about how, how the Holy Spirit has been sent by God to dwell in you and to teach you the word of God, both in the learning of it and the living of it. Look. But you got, let the Holy Spirit bring the dynamic. The word of God becomes alive when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it. In the human spirit, it becomes alive. It's not a dead book. Every other book you're reading is. The author of this deal is all of them are alive. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy, all of them are alive. So you get to speak to a living author talking about so in verse 5 do you think that the scripture speaks in no with, with, in no purpose or in vain therefore you see he he's run this system on us right he's laid this thing out as sweet as it can be when you're looking for markers they're all over the place in james 4 5 james is using a debate debate sarcasm He's using debate sarcasm with a rhetorical question to make a point. Do you think that? The scriptures are in vain? Speak in vain? Well, most of us don't even know they speak. But they certainly don't speak in vain, I can tell you that. In James 4, 6, James began addressing the solution with an adversative conjunction. In contrast, he gives greater grace. And then he jumps into it. He quotes Proverbs 3.34, which we've been waiting for when he talked about the scriptures in verse 5. 
Okay? Yeah, I know. This is a this is a lesson to put you to sleep. But I'm going to tell you, if you want to study the Bible, I just told you how to do it. And I told you, you don't have to have Ron Edema, but you do have to have the Holy Spirit. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us. Both by the automobile and by the internet. <clears throat> and although some people might say, well, I didn't get a thing from that Bible study. They would have if the Bible was important. And if for no other reason tonight, when they say, I didn't get anything from that Bible study, they were wrong because their attitude towards the scripture, which is the source of their faith, and that faith is a source of the dynamics of their everyday life, they've just threw under the bus. We're trying to say the Bible is the most important book in your life. It's more important than that cell phone, that television, <laughs> that radio. And all the books you have in your library and the education that you have that you're still paying for. The Bible. It is the only book that the only possession that you have you can take from you when you die. As a believer. It's the only possession you have. And you can't take it with you because you carry it in your hand. You can only take it if you carry it in your heart. It's the eternal word of God. Father, I, I don't know. You know, my job is to teach it, not to make people understand it, not to, not to make them believe it, but to make them understand it. I tried my best tonight to bring excitement into the study of the word of God in the English Bible. I pray the Holy Spirit would take this message, encourage our hearts to study the Bible Take our time with it. Look at it. Study it because that's the way it works in us. So that Hebrews 4.12 would come to reality. The word of God as it works in my life and cuts through all the stuff in my life to get down to where I live in the intents and purposes of my heart. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.